Welcome, everybody, to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette, and I'm so glad you're with us today to stay curious. We got January 17th, 2023 today, and my co-producer, Marty Winkle, is behind our Streamlabs uh, computer here to give you a program about some space history. We're going to talk about the astronaut group chosen on this date, 1990, called the Hairballs. And we got an astronaut birthday, and we're going to celebrate the launch of Columbia STS-107 and its mission started on uh, January 16th. And we've got some excellent photography from uh, rocket launch photographer Carlton Bailey. So stay tuned for that and uh, kick it off here a little bit by just saying that, yeah, I'm dressed a little sw little dressed up here today. This is my outfit to wear as I'm the community liaison for the American Space, Space Museum attending chamber functions and so forth. And uh, when it rains, it pours in my world. I had two board meetings today, one with the City of Titusville Flag and Memorial Committee and setting everything up for our Sunday, January 29th celebration of our Apollo Challenger and Columbia astronauts. Uh, it is a, and we'll don't have the meme for that up here. We'll do that the rest of the week. It will be broadcast at one o'clock on our Stay Curious YouTube channel. So you, be, wherever you're at in the world, you'll be able to watch as we honor the 17 astronauts who lost their lives in those three tragedies. It is a patriotic and emotional ceremony. And I'm privileged to be one of the master ceremonies for that event. Again, 1 o'clock Sunday, January 29th, we will honor Elon Ramon as the Israeli embassy has, has, has asked us to move this date from the traditional Saturday to Sunday so they can honor uh, their Jewish space hero, Elon Ramon. So... Uh, also, is it today at another chamber uh, function of the Titusville Chamber? Um, it was uh, the uh, uh, Titusville Area Visitors Council that deals with all the tourism here. And of course, our Space Museum is, is one of the members there, and I attend for us. A couple interesting notes, uh, uh, Marty, as I say hi to Marty Winkle. How you doing, buddy? Doing good, Mark. How are you doing? Good, good. I know you've been in in your share of these board meetings throughout your career and so forth, and uh, they're important, but it's fun to, sh to share that we had 57 launches in 2022, and they're predicting for 2023. How many launches do you think they're predicting, Marty? Over or under 80? 80. Above or, or under? You just said 80? 80. 80. 80. 92 is what they... Uh, Air Force, Space Force has uh, on tap to launch in 2023. And a representative uh, was there at the meeting that said, in 2025, you can expect over 200 launches off of our Space Coast a year. Incredibly, every other day almost. Of course, a Blue Origin will be coming on the line, as well as a half a dozen other startup companies that are hoping to cash in on the small low earth payloads here from our space coast. So that was interesting. 57 was the total last year that we saw here uh, from the Indian River, just nine miles or just three blocks from where we're at. And of course, this Kennedy Space Center and Cape Canaveral Space Force are nine to 15 miles from us here. So thought I'd throw out there a few statistics of that. If you stayed here, the average in November, they, they took in over... $1.75 million in taxes from the heads in beds in the month of November, a, a record break of over 25%. And the average cost of a room in Titusville was $108 in November. Though many of you paid up to $200 for sure. Uh, there's still a lot of $75 to $80 uh, hotels around here. So tourism is big and grand here and the Delivery room of America's space age, and that is Brevard County, Florida. So, a few little uh, tidbits there that make it worth sharing with you all. As I'm, as I got a sport coat on here, 
attending these events. I want to say hi to Rich Turner and John Darlington and Marius Krawazinski, who said they'd be watching today's show. Also, Chris Kirby, Jen Brown, Lynn McDaniel, and Ben Scarborough, just some of the people that have liked some of our posts today on our Facebook page that's still growing. 10,100 followers on Facebook, and we don't really want to be the biggest. We just want to be one of the more interesting and reliable social media outlets out there for you to see some wonderful pictures of launch photography, uh, like I posted from Carlton Bailey of the uh, uh, gorgeous uh, launch we had Sunday of the Falcon Heavy. So let's kick it off a little bit with our shuttles of January. Everybody knows that we love celebrating the shuttles of the month because uh, 350 some people flew our American Space Shuttle, 135 launches, of course, 134 truly successful missions, and we lost two crews. Uh, in January, all five shuttles were launched. Of course, uh, Challenger didn't make it to orbit. 56 humans orbited the Earth. Uh, Marsha Ivins and Brent Jett flew twice in January. Uh, interestingly, of the 10 launches of January, eight of them were before noon, Marty. And I got a shout out to our my co-producer, Marty, was a launch process services uh, manager over about 40 people in the computer end of it there. Uh, Marty, you didn't have to stay up late or get up too late, uh, stay up too late on those launches, did you? I guess not. <laughs> That's all in ancient history for you. But I got to get him to talk on our UCAC family sponsored uh, microphone there. Thank you, Tom, Vicki, and Mark UCAC for providing the funds to get us another microphone here uh, so Marty can talk. If you're looking for that big chunk of tax deduction from Uncle Sam as you're doing your taxes, we're the ones that we can. Uh, relieve you of some of your funds and you may earmark them when you do that and say you want to spend on Stay Curious because we certainly have a wish list of things we could could use in our humble studio here at uh, downtown Titusville. So um, of the 10 missions that you're looking at there, uh, four of them deployed satellites. That was the wheelhouse. Two missions to the Mir Space Station there. And we talked about some of those last week, uh, 89 and... Um, what was the other one that went up there, Marty? Uh, uh, 81. Uh, two laboratories were launched, the, uh, the micro lab uh, and of uh, STS-42 there, and, of course, the, the big space lab uh, that was on Columbia that was launched on January 16th, uh, 2003, and one Department of Defense mission. In fact, the first one there, that, that just to the left of me beside the Challenger, 51L, the beautiful eagle there, very military looking there. So we've talked about uh, these missions off and on throughout the month. Uh, be sure and catch last Wednesday's uh, episode with Hugh Harris, the voice of NASA, comes on every month to talk about these missions of the shuttle. And we have some other guests lined up for us uh, the rest of the month. Uh, this is a week where we had some conflicts with some people that couldn't do it. So, Marty, you got a question? Yeah, Dave Sang is asking, was there any other month where all shuttles were launched? Well, Dave, I am not sure. Uh, I would have to say yes, and that'd probably be November where we had 18 shuttles launched. But um, as we're going through this, I'm sinking that in my brain cells, buddy. So we'll be checking that out for you. Great question. We appreciate Dave staying up there in Michigan watching. And he can't wait to meet us, Marty. And some of these one uh, A-listers we have out there, we'll certainly get you beside us here and, and talk about uh, what you like about space, why you're a space geek, and, and what attracts you to stay curious. So, well, we've got, let's see, kick off here with... Um, of course, the Astronaut Memorial out there at our Space View Park constantly has flowers put in front of it. And uh, this is from Perry Hall. Thank you, Perry, for posting this picture uh, on our Facebook page with roses out there. Uh, these are pylons. In the back one, you see names on them, and Marty has his name out there. He forked over 100 bucks to support our museum to have your name put on these pylons on three sides. Uh, the ones in the Apollo 
gallery have the handprints of the Apollo astronauts. We don't have shuttle astronauts out at this one. 300 shuttle astronauts is too big of an expense to get uh, many of them. But we do have a few shuttle astronauts in our museum like um, uh, um, Bob Crippen. Bob Crippen. Uh, I'm thinking of um, Sally Ride, Sally Ride Eileen Collins. Uh, we've got uh, the first female spacewalker. Uh, we have Sullivan and the uh, the pilot we have under our, our uh, commander, under our truly Richard uh, Dick Truly, we have in our museum. So, some of them, but what a humble, awesome museum to our fallen heroes, the Columbia and Challenger astronauts. They're etched in marble and forever in our hearts. And people all year long leave flowers out there. There's also a memorial that will show throughout before the end of the month of the workers who've lost their lives at the Space Center and some tragedies out there, including several just hit by cars in an intersection, lost their lives. Marty, you have a question or comment? No, I was going to mention uh, Dave Nelson, our NASA Administrator. D yes, yes, we do. Difference. We've got uh, Mr. Nelson here, uh, right beside Buzz and Neil we have in our museum, and he says his flight of STS-61C, I think, in the month was uh, a... Uh, he was a space participant, is what he calls himself. Uh, uh, yeah, 50, no, it wasn't 51C. What was the January one there? Instead of calling himself a true astronaut. So, uh, Bill Nelson doing a good job, uh, along with Pam Melroy, the deputy director, and Bob Cabana, third in charge of our space uh, endeavors uh, through NASA. So... Well, we got a big happy birthday today to a popular astronaut who was once the uh, chief of the astronaut office, and he was also uh, a pre vice president and COO of the United Space Alliance that was the management group of the shuttle its, t its last 10 years of its uh, three-decade run. Uh, that would be Mr. Dan Brandenstein. Happy 80th birthday to Dan, born January 17th. 1943 in Watertown, Wisconsin. He's a naval aviator who piloted one shuttle mission and then commanded three others, Marty. And you know I'm impressed with those one-time uh, pilots that come up, become commanders. Sometimes it's not all of their adaptness to flying a space shuttle, but uh, it's the luck of the draw where no one's available and the other guys are assigned to other flights already, so he's moved up quickly. But this is a, a very smart astronaut. He piloted STS-8 in September 83, the first night launch, uh, and deploying satellites from Challenger. He was a commander of Discovery 51G in June 85. Uh, with an astronomy mission in STS-32. He spent his 47th birthday in space, Marty, in January 1990 when they retrieved the long-duration exposure facility. And he was commander of Endeavor, the Endeavor's uh, maiden flight in uh, 1992, STS-49. And he became an astronaut in 1979. And um, uh, he... Let's see, a naval aviator. He was into mathematics in school and uh, 80 years old young today for Char Daniel Charles Brandenstein, the pride of Watertown, Wisconsin. Uh, here's another, there's his NASA blue suit shot there of when uh, he was pilot of STS-8. I mean, uh, yeah, STS-8. Um, and actually, the you know, they don't call them co-pilots, Marty. There's never a co-pilot in the shuttle world. It's commander and pilot. And, of course, the commander does the most flying. The joke is that the pilot, his main job, you know what the main job of the pilot is, Marty? Lower the landing gear. Exactly, exactly there, my friend. Lower the landing gear five seconds before. And I've been told there's some people that didn't hit that button quick enough or switches sometimes. and uh, But they get to do that while the, the commander's flying the bird. And here's another picture of him a few years ago. Looking good. He's aged well, hasn't he, Marty? Dan Brandenstein. We'd love to see you out at the Space Coast uh, at the Astronaut Du Jour at the Visitors Complex there. So happy birthday to him. 
uh, he was a popular one on, on, on there today. So, but we want to talk about this group of astronauts. This is an incredible group of astronauts, Marty. On this date, January 17th, 1990, the 13th group of NASA astronauts was announced to the world. 23 faces there. And they had no idea what was in store for them, okay, on this day when this day was taken in front of the taxi that they would be driving back and forth from Kennedy Space Center in Houston. And all of the contractors were pieces and parts of the shuttle were being built. Every group of astronauts gets to name the previous group, all right? So Group 12's name was the Gaffers. And what does that, the gaffers, now there's a gaffer in the movie business. And I don't have a picture of group 12 in 1987, but they were called the gaffers for George Abbey's final 15. And George Abbey was the famous director of crew operations in Johnson Space Center. And basically he could give the thumbs down on you being an astronaut. And there's a few that we've talked to Marty that have. And we've talked to a few astronauts also that may have fell out of disfavor from George Abbey. We may have had dinner with one of them a couple of months ago, Marty, uh, that uh, got their, their career squashed by Mr. Abbey. But hey, he's in charge. He's got his own reasons. I am not questioning any of that. So the gaffers, the George Abbey Final 15 of 1987, got to choose the name of this group, the 13th. All right. And what name did they come up with? The hairballs. Because of the unlucky number 13, black cat, the hairballs. All right. 23 total, five of them women. I think that's one of the largest women classes percentage wise. Incredibly, these 23 human beings flew on 91 of the 135 space shuttle missions. 67% of our shuttles, if, if you wanted to guess someone that was on the shuttle, you would want to guess one of these names here. And I'm going to talk a little about quickly about each one of them because we can on Stay Curious and we love celebrating our shuttle astronauts. As I have there in my, my uh, uh, slide, six commanders came out of this group. Six had five flights. All right, 11 had four missions, all right? So 17 of the 23 would fly more than four, four or more times in space. And if you were to ask each one of these astronauts, you know, uh, what, you know, what, how many times you think you would go to space? I just think that's an incredible stat, Marty, that out of here. So who we have there in no particular order, the pilots were Ke Kenneth Cockerell, five flights. He was out of the Navy. Uh, uh, he did. He took the Destiny Laboratory up there, uh, and he was from Eileen Collins, the first pilot who's a female of any spaceship, and then the first commander of any spaceship. She did four flights, including the important return to flight. She had two missions to the Mir space station. One was the uh, rendezvous. The other was a docking. She deployed the Chandra X-ray observatory and had a mo and one of the three engines. Uh, had to be shut down, yet they did abort to orbit. That's the only time that that happened in the 135, 30 year history of the shuttle. And then, of course, Eileen was the commander of the important return to flight after Columbia's disaster, 114. Uh, we had Bill Gregory's in there with one flight. James Halsell has five flights. Uh, and uh, uh, Charlie Precourt had four flights. Rick Surfoss. Uh, Commander, three flights. Terrence Wilcutt, four flights. We saw Terry Wilcutt talk, Marty. Uh, so uh, he was on two mere missions. So some really cool pilots and people that have done great things. The mission specialists in the group of hairballs here. Maybe they're, you've seen them in your hometown. Daniel Borsch, Leroy Chow, Michael Clifford. Michael Clifford has lost his life. Uh, Richard uh, Searfoss, by the way, has passed away out of this group. Nancy Curie, she had four missions, including uh, uh, Columbia's last flight to the Hubble Space Telescope, 109. Bernard Harris did a couple EVAs. Susan Helms, five flights as a mission specialist. She later is now General Helms of the U.S. Space Force. Tom Jones grew up in Australia, I think, has become an American citizen. He has four flights. 
Uh, William MacArthur, we saw him, Marty, talk at the Space Center a couple times. Uh, he has four flights. He's an Army guy. Jim Newman, a physicist, flew on four flights. Ellen Ochoa, an engineer, four flights. And then she became the uh, first female director of Johnson Space Center. Uh, Ronald Sega, a couple flights. Don Thomas, Marty, we've seen Don Thomas, the Ohio knot, give his talk at uh, Kennedy Visitors Complex. He's had four flights. Janice Voss lost her life to cancer after five flights of a space shuttle. That just doesn't seem fair. Carl Waltz, five flights, a physicist. Amazing for a physicist to go that many flights. Peter Wissoff, four flights, and David Wolf. Five flights, including a stay on the Russian Mir space station. So, wanted to give shout out to the hairballs there. We've lost three of them, uh, 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 have passed on. Like I said, Richard Searfoss, uh, Michael Clifford died last year of, um, uh, I think, ALS, or, uh, or the, uh, no, it was leukemia, actually, I think. And uh, then, um, the other one was uh, Janice Voss, who lost her life. So we honor the hairballs out there. And you see one of them at, a, at a, one of the talks they do around the country, uh, tell them that you heard about them on Stay Curious. Well, next up is to celebrate the launch of our heroes of the Columbia STS-107 mission. Uh, and here they are uh, heading out. This is, These are all pictures from... Um, Carlton Bailey, thank you, Carlton, for sharing this walkout photograph. All these pictures are Carlton's, and I shared these on Facebook yesterday, and Carlton said that of all of the crude launches he did, and he's done over 70 of them, uh, he was most satisfied with the pictures of this mission. Of course, they lost their lives 16 days later on reentry, and 20 years ago on February 1st, so... We, again, honor their name, their accomplishments, and uh, we'll be talking more about them, led by Rick Husband. There's Willie McCool, Kalp Nachala. Uh, you've got Lauren, uh, uh, Laurel uh, Clark there in the back, uh, Dan Brown and Elon Ramon, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm missing the one, the one, I don't have my shirt my, in front of me, Anderson. Yes, Greg Anderson there in the back. So here was the beautiful liftoff. Uh, I left my shuttle scroll over there. I forget the time of day. I think it was an afternoon launch, right after lunch, one o'clock, something like that. Carlton nailed it with a remote camera there that was provided to him by the UCAC brothers out of Pennsylvania. Couldn't come down to all the launches. So they stowed their gear and trusted it to Carlton Bailey. We've had all three of them on our show, and we will have more in the future to talk about this, how they captured these iconic images of the shuttle launch. And this is a special one because it's about this moment that the chunk of foam came off and hit the left wing and punched a hole in it. And uh, that uh, sealed the fate of these seven brave souls. You hardly ever see this picture, Marty. Kind of the butt end of the SRBs and the, the three SSME rockets. But there's the big orange fuel tank that that provided the fuel for those three shuttle engines on there. A beautiful side light on that. And it was a photographer's delight, I'm sure, that that uh, January launch. And here is a wonderful side shot. I believe Carlton would have had to have been holding a camera to do this, somewhere around 600 millimeters. I love seeing the exhaust coming off your SSMEs there, Marty. Everything looks nominal to you, doesn't it, there? Sure it does. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the point, uh, and you're looking for those, what do you call those blue little, the diamond points there? Is that what you all call those blue characteristic uh, uh, points of the energy coming out of the nozzles? Yeah, you know, Mark, I really I, 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 I don't remember. Well, but he's an engineer, so he calls them something else technical, but, and I'm just teasing you, Marty. But what a gorgeous shot of, of, of Challenger, I mean, Columbia, uh, going up in space. There we saw that one. 
And then this is another uh, remote camera set up there, the water shot. Many of you photographers uh, that have covered the shuttle know where that is at exactly. Uh, the white smoke going to the left is from the solid rocket motors launched at 6.6 .6 seconds before the pop bottle rockets of the solid rockets are, are, are lit and they can never be turned off for two minutes. And astronauts have always told us that ride, uh, the first two minutes is like, well, just take your vehicle down some railroad tracks between the railroad rails and go down the ties. And that gives you an idea of, of what they go through for two minutes. And then when the SS, when the solid rocket boosters go away, it's like a smooth sports car, they say. And what a beautiful shot that Carlton took. Little did he know at the time he took this picture that uh, this would sort of be a tribute to the the lasting image of that launch Everest in our mind. Right there, right there is the clock, the famous clock at the press site. And uh, Carlton, you found a very unique image there to capture that contrail there on January 16th, 2003. So that's what we have for our shuttle of the day here. A uh, little peak of the sun there I'm going to tease you with, our shuttles of the month. Uh, believe me, I'm amazed I even put this much together for us today, Marty. I'm looking, oh, there I am. I'm trying to get rid of that uh, with two board meetings today. But here is our, what a gorgeous shot this is. And I'd like to know who photographed this night landing. Marty particularly chose that as our green screen because I know that the photographer had to shoot a flash strobe to get this kind of illumination and what gives it away is right there inside the the engine the light is reflecting off those uh, actuators or whatever they call them that spurt the the uh, liquid uh, hydrogen and oxygen uh, to burn in that baby there and you got the OM's pods with the 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 two reaction control thrusters there on the back I love that shot and kind of a looking at the shuttle in the rear view mirror as it lands. Uh, and this could be the last landing because uh, uh, STS-135 did land just before daylight. So after, what does that say on the wing? It says Endeavor. All right, so uh, Atlantis was the last launch. So uh, that's Endeavor landing there. So we never want to look back. But what we want you to do now is look up. I said we never want to look back and forget the wonderful legacy that the space shuttle era has changed our 21st century. And that's why we talk about it so much. 22 years of occupancy by the International Space Station. We have seven astronauts on board there now, three Russians, three Americans, and a Japanese astronaut. And Chinese has three Takionauts orbiting in their space station. Ten humans orbiting the Earth right now. Marty, growing up, we'd have thought there'd be hundreds orbiting the Earth when you talk about the 2020s. But uh, that just shows how hard it is, okay, to do. Well, I want you all to look up tonight, uh, wherever you're at. And when the sun sets, you're going to look to the east. And that bright star is not a star. That's the planet Venus. Brighter than any object in the sky except the sun and the moon, always. And because it's covered with clouds, and those clouds, though, reflect light like a mirror. Uh, though Venus is the identical twin of Earth in size and mass, it is actually the hellish twin because beneath that 30-mile-thick layer of clouds, and that's huge, mostly carbon dioxide and sulfuric acid, Below that cloud deck is the surface of Venus that's 900 degrees hot. Hotter than the planet Mercury, all right? And uh, from time to time, we talk about the, the Russians have landed, I think, three space probes on Venus in the 80s and 90s. And uh, we're going back with some space probes to investigate why did this planet so similar to Earth in size and fairly, you know, it's it's we're 93 million miles away. Venus is around the 60 million mile mark. Why did it turn into this runaway greenhouse? And is that something the Earth is going to experience in millions of years from now? But look at Venus, revel in how beautiful that looks. And then you're going to look to the directly overhead when it starts to get dark in that twilight. And Jupiter's directly overhead. 
a little bit fainter than Venus, and then a little bit to the east from Jupiter are two bright stars, red stars, but the reddest one is and brightest is Mars, and to the about five o'clock, and a clock dial from Mars is Aldebaran, the eye of Taurus the bull. And the Pleiades are right up there, the star cluster too. The moon's out of the way in our sky right now, so it's a beautiful time to go out and get you some starlight. And we want to caution before I tell you to look at the sun. Do not look at the sun with binoculars, telescope, any optical instrument uh, without having a solar filter on that. But when the sun sets, and in that crud of smog and so forth that's everywhere on our Earth, you will see this bright sunspot right there, all right? Yes, this sunspot is visible, all right? Did that go to a four to get me out of there? I, I kind of like four. that, huh? What do you want? I went to four. Oh, good, okay. Yeah, good, good. But th but this completely erases me. I'm No, it doesn't. Okay. No, you went to I went to equal there. You now you're at four. I was, all right. So this is the sun today, folks. A, a photograph taken by a, uh, a NASA, telescope, NASA telescope on a satellite that's kind of orbiting between the Earth and the sun called the Solar Dynamic Observatory. But you can see this, and you all... The best way to do it with a telescope is to project it on a piece of paper. And you project the telescope eyepiece on a piece of paper. And there are covered with spots. It's an 11-year sunspot cycle. And we're going to talk about that on Stay Curious uh, probably next Monday when we like doing our backyard astronomy session. But the sun is heating up, so to speak, as we have an 11-year cycle where uh, every six years or so, we have a lot of sunspots that create aurora, also make the sun slightly hotter. And these are cooler areas of the sun where electromagnetic air, uh, uh, loops are hitting each other. And it's all solar physics, but it's all pretty well understood today. Uh, but we watch the sun. Now, notice how, Marty, the center of the sun's real bright and the edges aren't as bright. You know why that happens? We call that limb darkening. Because we are so close to the sun, 93 million miles away, and it's almost a million miles in diameter, okay, that, that 880,000 miles, that's almost a million miles. Actually, light from the sides of the sun is 400,000 miles further away. Get me? The sides 400,000 miles distance from the surface here, all right, if it's 800,000 miles across. So... When, when you do the properties of light, it light diminishes, uh, its intensity drops off in like a ratio of uh, one, you double the distance, it's one quarter as bright. Not one half as bright, but one quarter as bright. And that's why we see this limb darkening. But the sun is covered with spots. You can see the bright one with a naked eye or those solar glasses that you might have from the, the 2017 Great American Eclipse five years ago that uh, most of us saw. So haul those out and you can look safely at the sun. You're going to be amazed at all the freckles on it. And we'll tell you more about that on a Backyard Astronomy Stay Star Curious soon. And as you're looking up there, I pulled this picture off by a gentleman in uh, Europe that took a collage of the moon. Yes, we can see the surface of Mars right now. For the next two months, we'll be able to see the surface of Mars. But by about April or May, it's going to be too far away. Right now, it's about 60 million miles away. It came as close as 40 million miles uh, a month ago. It's We're separating in our orbits. And though it takes two years for Mars to go around the sun, two Earth years, uh, it will be over 100 million miles away from us by summertime and look just like a red disk in the sky. Below Mars here is a comet that you're going to be hearing about, but it's going to be hard to see. It will be barely naked eye in uh, uh, toward in the first week of February. But it doesn't look like much. That's why I showed you amateur astronomers taking these pictures. It shows just a tiny thing. Excuse me. I got the Chamber of Commerce hiccups, I think. Ah, that tastes good. 
And we've got the sun as it looks not in the light like you'd see it with your filters on, but as it looks in a special hydrogen filter where we see more surface features on the surface of our sun. Called capital sun, S-U-N. It's a star called sun. And it aggravates me that sun, earth, and moon, you see lowercase in lots of literature, they're personal pronoun names, okay? Like Mark and Marty. Capitalize these guys are the most important objects in our in our in our lives. But the sun is just a star. And I had a boss one time tell me, the sun's not a star, Mark. Everybody knows it's the sun. And I said to that boss, oh, okay. You know, because uh, maybe I had my employee review coming up in a month there instead of telling me he was full of it. But uh, just like all the stars in the sky, most of them have planets orbiting them, just like our sun has nine planets, including Pluto. Well, Marty, I'm going to give a shout out as we look at our shuttles of January. Gary Gerald, William Whiting, Cliff Watson gave us another two bucks in stars. You all need to catch up with that. Uh, we got the UCAC brothers, Mark and Tom watching, Doug uh, Forrest, Christopher Mick. Good to see your name out there. He's a, a science educator. Cynthia Rossi, uh, Steve Hammer, Dave Renicky is watching from Australia. Hey, Dave, g give you a big shout out. Dave is like the Carl Sagan of astronomy in Australia, and he also is a radio host on a country western uh, radio show there, Dave. Uh, he and uh, Cliff both visited uh, America during the Great Eclipse, and I got to know them that way. Tom Silentano, thank you for staying curious, my friend. Rick Horner, Carlton Bailey, he's got his cats on his lap and, and uh, feeling good today, I'm sure. And Chris Callie, the wonderful space artist. Chris, thank you for your conversation yesterday, and we're going to be featuring more of Chris's art and his famous father, Paul, uh, on Stay Curious. And Daniel DeYoung, yeah, great to see you watching Stay Curious. He's our favorite airline pilot that's flying the friendly skies from time to time. And almost all these people have been in our studio. Doug Forrest has, Carlton, Chris. Uh, I think Tom's been in the building. Uh, and, uh, of course, William Whiting uh, and Gary Gerald. So everybody appreciates you all enjoying our Stay Curious program. Please watch it on YouTube. We will be broadcasting the Astronaut Memorial January 29th on Sunday at 1 o'clock on YouTube. Hope to get a big crowd watching that around the world as it's my privilege to be one of the Master of Ceremonies with Al Terrio on that. So before we go out here, Marty, one more question or comment. Comment from uh, Carlton Bailey. The landing was probably a NASA, either NASA remote at the end of the runway or a NASA staff photographer. The illumination could be a very well, could be very well from the, the Xeon lights that are that were positioned at the end of the runway, pointing down, so they weren't in the shuttle commanders or the pilot's eyes. All right, very good, Carlton, and he knows because he's only covered over 700 rocket launches, and like I said, been part of uh, most shuttle launches. His first one was uh, 51L on that fateful January 28th, 1986. Uh, what a way to break uh, your uh, chops in as a rocket uh, photographer there, Carlton. So uh, we thank everybody for taking their time to watch Stay Curious. Most of all, Marty and I thank our wonderful executive director, Karen Conklin, for leading our our. our our wonderful museum uh, into a new era. We've got uh, head over 100 and uh, 50 kids in the building uh, with uh, Darren Roberts teaching them STEAM education, uh, three sessions a day, 12 kids, I think, max, uh, learning all kinds of science, uh, doing experiments uh, to emphasize the principles of science like you see on some of those Saturday morning shows. So um, anyway, we're we appreciate everybody supporting our museum. And once again, it's tax time. Go to our website. There's a tab up there for your tax deductible donations. We'll send you a form and you can uh, shave off a little of your tax debt there. So until tomorrow, when we're going to bring you another hump day of Stay Curious, I'm Mark Marquette saying we can't wait to see you in our museum to bridge the space between us.